Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here. I love seeing so many uh, different faces from the community, so many people who have been uh, past members of our Community Justice Academy. Thank you for coming out here. I think it's always important to recognize the fact that the topics that we're about to discuss are always driven by the conversations that we have in the community. Uh, these are not topics that, that we necessarily pick. It's, it's based on uh, the conversations that we have with you guys when we're visiting people uh, in all different sides of our county. And uh, that's why we decided to have this Community Justice Academy to hopefully be in a position to help people better understand uh, certain issues within the criminal justice system, how the prosecutor's office is playing a role in that, but also let you as a community know how we can better work together to address some of the challenges that we are facing uh, in our community. One of the coolest parts about this job is all the great people I get to meet and I see so many people uh, with prior Community Justice Academy shirts on, which I always love to see. Uh, feel free to wear those next week, and then the third week, of course, if you're here all three times, you get uh, the, the shirt. Uh, just so everybody knows, I have seen it. It is a beautiful green shirt. It's going to look great. You guys all look good in it. Uh, so if you, can, if you can make it with us for these next three weeks, we'll make sure that everybody gets a shirt. And uh, really look forward to, to making sure uh, that we have a great month of October as it relates to the Community Justice Academy. So thank you. Uh, we could not do this without our incredible partners, which is you, the community. I think uh, anytime you're fortunate enough to be an elected representative, you always need to remind yourself you work for the community, the community doesn't work for you. And, and so we really want to be here to provide services to help uh, everybody better understand what's going on in the prosecutor's office. Uh, so thank you for being a part of that process. Uh, and I think it's important that we get down to work. And, and so. Today, I'm very excited about the topic, which is about uh, the opioid and fentanyl crisis that we have in our community here. Uh, I, one of the biggest challenges that we face in our community is drugs, and in particular, opioids. And if you want to take a step back and kind of look at where we were maybe 10 years ago, one of the driving forces behind the opioid crisis was we had a lot of pill mills in terms of doctors over prescribing, people stealing prescriptions, and they were getting hooked on opioids. We did a good job of cracking down on that, and then people started to turn to heroin. We did a better job of cracking down on heroin, and now people are using the worst drug imaginable, which is fentanyl. And I'm a big believer that it's very important that we take a very balanced approach to these issues. It can't all be about enforcement. What can we do to try to give people the tools to be successful? But uh, when you're dealing with individuals who are literally pushing poison in our community, and poisoning people where they lose their lives, there has to be an enforcement mechanism as well, which is what we're going to talk about today during our conversation about, number one, why this law is necessary, and number two, what the process looks like for us to move forward with a successful criminal prosecution involving a dealing causing death. Uh, and so we could not do this without incredible partnerships with people in the community. We are fortunate to have Alfie here from the coroner's office. For those of you who don't know, Alfie hey. runs the coroner's office. Uh, long time community person who's very active in the community, but they have also been uh, so vital, and they're gonna talk a little bit about their role in terms of how we're able to prosecute these cases, but they've taken on additional responsibilities, taken on additional work to help make us uh, be in a position to be able to file some of these cases. And so we're really grateful for everything the coroner's office has done to help us move forward with these cases. The sheer numbers in terms of what they see each and every single day is overwhelming, yet they still make time to try to help us uh, be able to file these cases. So we're grateful not only for their participation here tonight, but all the work that they do each and every single day to allow us to address uh, this ongoing crisis. We are also very fortunate uh, to have our friends from the, the DEA. Uh, we have uh, Michael Gannon with us as the assist uh, assistant special agent in charge. Uh, he has a very thick accent from Boston, uh, <laughs> and, and so I, I give him a hard time. Uh, Bob right there is also from Boston, so we're surrounded by people from Boston. Uh, don't read anything into that, uh, visit, but uh, you know they're, they're both here because uh, they really want to demonstrate their commitment to, to trying to solve this issue. Uh, and then we have uh, Nick Andrews from the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department who's going to kind of talk over a little bit about IMPD's role. But as you can see, in order for us to build these cases, it's a collaborative process. We need local partners, we need county partners, we need our friends at the federal agency level to be able to build these types of cases. And so we're grateful to kind of pull the curtain back and let you know exactly what it looks like to address this horrible 
an incredible challenge that we have as it relates to opioid crisis, uh, the opioid crisis. Uh, kind of leading things off for us is going to be Rob Beetson, who, as mentioned, is from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, but he's also a deputy prosecutor here in the Marion County Prosecutor's Office. He's in charge of our screening division, which means that he is the individual who's ultimately responsible for what cases get filed or not get filed here in Marion County. It's a, a tremendous responsibility, and a couple of years ago, the Indiana legislature passed a new law called Dealing Causing Death, meaning that if you were someone who dealt drugs and it ended up leading to someone losing their life, uh, we could file a new charge to ultimately try to hold that person accountable. Uh, when we got that new law, there was no playbook in terms of how to do it because it was brand new. And so Rob was really one of the architects of trying to build these types of investigations. And very quickly, when Rob and I discussed this, we realized we're, needed, we're going to need help from the DEA. We're going to need help from IMPD, and we're going to need help from the coroner's office. And uh, fortunately, we had very willing and able community partners who were willing to assist us in these types of investigations. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to Rob so he can talk a little bit about where we are and where we are going. So give it up for my good friend, Rob Beeson. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out to our first CJA session of the year. Uh, I'm coming up on 10 years as a prosecutor at the end of this month. Uh, early on in my career, I was screening drug dealing cases at the prosecutor's office. And um, I'd see a lot of heroin cases, a lot of cocaine cases, a lot of methamphetamine cases. And after about 18 months on the job, I started to see cases that involved this stuff called fentanyl. And I knew it as something that you'd get in a patch in the hospital if you were seriously ill and needed pain medication. Nobody had any idea how this stuff was winding up as a street drug in Marion County. Um, it was totally new to us. We talked to our partners over at the crime lab to figure out what was going on. Now I can tell you we almost never see heroin cases anymore. If you see a case involving opioids, it is most likely going to be fentanyl or something even worse that Mike from DEA can talk about. So, I mean, this is a problem that is skyrocketing. Uh, anytime I do a jury trial involving a drug case, I always ask people when I do jury selection, how many of you have had your lives uh, affected by somebody who was addicted to drugs? And it doesn't matter race, age, socioeconomic class, neighborhood, most of the hands go up. I mean, it is a problem that affects so many people in our community. Um, and as Prosecutor Muir said, this new dealing resulting in death law is a way for us to use the criminal justice system to hold people accountable who are selling this poison and ending lives as a result. Uh, I thought it was important when we do this session to have representatives from all the partner agencies that we work with on these cases here. Uh, as Prosecutor Muir said, when we started out, there was no playbook on this. Uh, and in a really short period of time, the criminal justice agencies that work together in Marion County have been able to come together and come up with a really revolutionary approach to prosecute and investigate these cases. Uh, that starts really on the front lines with Alfie's people at the coroner's office. Uh, as chief deputy coroner, she supervises all of the deputy coroners who go out to these overdose scenes. And as we'll hear, as we'll hear tonight, they are instrumental in building these cases from the very first moment that EMS and police in the coroner's office responds. Uh, IMPD, represented here tonight by Lieutenant Andrews, they have been incredibly flexible in adjusting the way that they have responded to these cases. This used to fall entirely on the homicide unit over there. Already overburdened by shootings and stabbings and traditional homicide cases. So then to add on to it, this new law that says we can treat drug dealers almost as murderers, it was just too much of a burden. And Lieutenant Andrews is going to talk about the way that IMPD has changed their response and this new task force that they're actually building right now to respond to these cases. And then finally, ASAC Gannon from the DEA. Uh, they have been just an incredible federal partner to give us the resources we need to investigate these cases. Every single time I touch one of these cases, I learn some new tool or technology that our federal law enforcement partners are rolling out to investigate these crimes and bring them to us to file. So I really do appreciate everybody being here tonight. Uh, I think we'll start with Alfie. She can give us some background on the overdose epidemic in Marion County, uh, which you'll be able to see as she goes through some of these slides here. The problem really is staggering. And her office has done a phenomenal job keeping up with, with the burden. 
Thank you. I'm not going to stand at the podium because, for one, I'm too short. So, you be able to see me. so I'm just going to stand here where you can barely see me, but you can a little bit. So thank you for the compliments. I really appreciate that. So I've been with the coroner's office for 26 years. I know I only look 25. I just started when I was two. So um, in starting with the coroner's office, I've seen a lot, right? So one of the things that we started to see about 10 years ago was this increase in heroin deaths. And when we started to see these deaths that were occurring more often, you know, you have to identify what are the, the trends that we are seeing when we see deaths. And it's our job with the coroner's office to identify those trends and identify what is happening in our community. Why are people dying? What's happening at these death scene investigations? And how can we report that out to the various agencies such as these that can do something about preventing these deaths? So our number one job with the coroner's office is not just identifying a cause and manner of death, but it also involves making notifications to agencies that can prevent these deaths from occurring. So one of the things that we started to see way back in 2016 was we see the number of overdose deaths that were occurring. And so in my career history, I started with the coroner's office during the crack epidemic, and I started to see that, well, we didn't have deaths like we are seeing in 2016, so what's happening? So I'm nosy. My grandmother told me that a long time ago, like, child, you sure are nosy. Well, it helps when we're doing investigations, right? So we can go to those death scenes and ask questions and look at the scene and find out what's happening. That helps us to figure out what is going on in our community. So what we started to see in 2016 was an increase in numbers in death investigations. So when we started to see overdose deaths where we were seeing this changing trend of it went from pills to syringes and then to fentanyl. We were like, what is this fentanyl stuff? And then why are so many people now using heroin? Like, what is happening there? But we started to see a decrease in prescription drugs, the Oxycontin, the Oxycodone, and those types of drugs that were being prescribed to seeing increased numbers of heroin. And then, as you can see, the numbers drastically going up to those that uh, are, were dying with the result of heroin and fentanyl in their toxicology screen. So the total of drug overdoses, as you can see, has gone up steadily every single year. So what we, so what we were working with the homicide detectives um, on was, this is overwhelming for us. Like, what do we need to do here? What do we need to see? How can we prevent these deaths from happening? When you see numbers like this going up, you have to ask the question, what is happening and what can we do about it? So that's what the coroner's office job is, and that's what we did with alerting various agencies, the health department, the police agencies, what are you seeing, and how can we partner in preventing these deaths to ask more questions and get information and share that with the community. Next slide. So the fatal drug intoxication deaths um, per day, what we're seeing, we were seeing like one a day, but when you see one of that type of death a day beginning in 2016 to one and a half, then another 1.1, it doesn't, it seems like not much, right? But when we have a period of seven days and we're seeing not just one, but two per day or three per day, that's just an average, but there were days where we saw five drug overdose deaths every single day. It was overwhelming and we had to get answers as to what was happening. So one of the things that we started to see is, number one, we need more staff. Like, we were overwhelmed. We were going to death scene after death scene after death scene and trying to capture information from the survivors who were seeing these deaths and reporting the deaths and also capturing information to document what was on the scene. And just overall, a death scene investigation entails um, looking at the decedent, but also looking at the scene. What's on the scene? Are we seeing pills? Are we seeing syringes? Are we seeing straws? What are we seeing? Are we seeing powdery substances and documenting all of that? So again, because I'm nosy, I'm asking my investigators, what are you seeing on these death scene investigations? Because we need to capture that, and then we need to figure out what to do with it. If, and at one point, I even said, well, we need to test what we're seeing on the scenes as well. Like, what is it? Is it the drug fentanyl that's in every single substance that we find on scene? And the answer in most cases, in 90% of the cases, was fentanyl was in everything. It was in the pills, 
It was in the powdery substance, it was in the syringes, the straws, everything. So again, just capturing that information so that we could share that so something could be done with that information. Next slide. So as you can see, part of what we do is after we conduct the death scene investigation, it's our responsibility to conduct an examination. Rather, that is an external exam where we look at the body externally, we take into account what's at the scene, and then we do a toxicology, which is just a drawing of specimen. So it could be vitreous fluid from the eye, it could be urine or blood to tell us what is in the body. What was it that someone may have ingested that caused their death? So one of the things that we started to see was all of the different types of drugs that were in, had been ingested by people who were dying of these overdoses. And the question became, well, where is this fentanyl coming from? You know, as he just indicated, we were seeing heroin initially, and then heroin started to go down, and we weren't seeing much heroin, but we were seeing more fentanyl. And we couldn't understand where this was coming from, and our toxicology labs we're kind of struggling to keep up with identifying the various types of fentanyl, identifying fentanyl to begin with, because you have to identify a method and a, which is a way to test for a substance that's in the specimen that you're collecting. So when we started to see these increased numbers, um, it was staggering. I mean, but we still, families did not understand what does this mean? What were they ingesting? They had a history of maybe using cocaine but now we're seeing fentanyl in their system. And so part of what we began to do was just start to continue to collect data, collect information. So you can see um, that all of the types of drugs that are more prominent in our toxicology screens um, that we were collecting from decedents that were coming into our facility to have these examinations and from these investigations. Next slide. And I just, yeah, I just want to jump in. One of the things that the coroner's office has been instrumental in helping us do is that if we're going to charge somebody with dealing a drug that results in a death, we need to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the drug caused the death. And what's that going to, what that is going to require at trial is a full-blown medical autopsy. So maybe if you can talk a little bit about what that entails and basically the number of autopsies that you have to do in these cases. Yeah, so one of the things that, as I mentioned, when we started to see these numbers increase, when we have 800, this is just one type of death investigation that we are conducting, 800, there is no way that we have the staff or the capacity to perform autopsies on every single one of those decedents. There's no way. So what we tried to do was identify um, what can we do to still get answers and information from an external exam. So an external exam is just looking at the body from head to toe and drawing those specimens that I just spoke about. So when we do that, that gives us enough information. But for these types of deaths, now listen, I had to talk to our forensic pathologists. They're the doctors that actually perform the autopsies. Because when I said, we're going to start performing autopsies on some of these cases so that we can have a valuable case that can be criminally prosecuted, the, the pathologists were up in arms. Oh, there's no way this can happen. And I'm like, this has to happen. So I was able to ask for, for some additional funding to support this effort. Because the bottom line is we want to have this information so that we can prosecute these cases. So without that autopsy, that can't happen. So finally, I was able to talk to the pathologist, get some more help and support for performing autopsies because an autopsy typically takes anywhere between two and four hours. So that's a lot of autopsies on a lot of cases. And we still don't perform autopsies on all 800 of our drug, drug overdose deaths, but we perform autopsies in all cases where there is a possibility for there to be criminal charges. So that was the buy-in that I had to get from my staff, from the pathologist, in order to make this happen. And I remember going to the first meeting in 2000, maybe 18, when we were talking to homicide detectives, and you know, we brought this to them, and we were already overwhelmed with homicide cases, right? And to add this on top of going to every single death scene that could potentially result in a homicide or dealing causing death case, Everybody was overwhelmed. I mean, we got, no, we, there's no way we can do this. There's no way we can do this. So I'm so happy. And I was, I was the first one, like, we got to do this, you know. Um, 
but I'm so happy that we are here now and able to do this because the bottom line is we want to prevent these deaths, but we have to be able to send a message to people to help them understand you cannot do this and deal drugs to a person and cause their death in Marion County. So in, from our office perspective, I always say, we speak for the dead, but we serve the survivors because the survivors are the ones who want answers and they want justice. And I can tell you, I talk to so many families that want this same justice and the least that we can do is make this attempt and work together collaboratively on this effort to do what we can. So someone is gonna to speak to what all the deputy coroners do. Now I had to make sure that they understood what the requirements were as well. It wasn't just me saying to them, you have to do this because this is a new policy. It was me standing side by side with them on those death scene investigations and helping them understand the importance of this so that they have more and additional work to do, but they understand the end result. We just had a meeting with a couple of the deputies that were involved in an end result case, and it makes them feel good that they could contribute to getting, bringing justice to a family from a dealing causing death case. So this is just um, the death intoxication uh, numbers uh, by race. And one of the things that we've seen recently over the last couple of years is that we are seeing more African Americans um, and people of color that are dying as a result of drug overdose deaths. Prior to this, we primarily saw white males. But in the more recent years, what we are seeing is that there are more people of color that are dying as a result of drug overdose deaths. Um, so one of the things that we are trying to do is provide services to these families. Um, we, we see the numbers going up, but then we see impacts in our community from those that are already marginalized and those that are already uh, dealing with some economic issues. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we are able to uh, provide services to these families. So the African American decedents that have died due to a drug overdose has increased 15% over the past six years, and that's been about 10% every single year. Um, economics, drugs, and homicides, what we've seen all go hand in hand over the last 10 years. Um, so we're still capturing that data, trying to put resources out, trying to give um, grant funding out to community partners to make sure that people understand drugs, understand life-saving drugs, rather that's medication-assisted treatment programs or rehabilitation programs. Our office, I ask to be directly responsible for making sure that there are community organizations that are receiving this funding to provide resources to people in the community in Marion County. Thank you, Alfie. And I have um, information up here on our um, annual report, which identifies a lot of this stuff, but you can get it on our website. Um, I don't want to give out all of the books, but you can look at these when you have an opportunity or go on our website and look at our annual report because it gives a lot more detailed information as far as our drug overdose stats. So we get to that background of the rising number of opioid deaths in Marion County. Uh, and really statewide. The legislature in 2018 crafted this law that's up here on the screen. It's referred to as the dealing resulting in death statute. But basically, if you deliver drugs to somebody and they use those drugs and die as a result, we can charge you with a level one felony. So aside from murder, that's the highest level felony under Indiana law. And it calls for a sentence of between 20 and 40 years. Now, statewide, since the time this law was enacted, there have been almost 7,000 fatal drug overdoses in the state and that fewer than 75 have been charged under this law. And that's really a result of the fact that the investigative techniques that you need to investigate a dealing resulting in death case just didn't evolve as quickly as that law was passed. So statewide, everyone had to figure out what is the playbook for investigating these cases. In some ways, they are just as complicated as a murder case. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the different types of evidence that's involved. Uh, but really, it's, it's more than that because not only do you have a, a murder investigation, you also have a drug dealing investigation that's grafted onto that. So we are fortunate here in Marion County that we have, have, uh, we have partners here who have been willing to completely rewrite the playbook and change the way these cases are investigated. So now we have Lieutenant Andrews from IMP talk a little bit about the overdose response team and the way that their investigative methods have evolved.
Good evening. Um, I'm Nick Andrews, I'm a lieutenant on IMPD. I've um, been on the department for 18 years. February of last year, uh, leadership came to me and said, hey, we have to uh, retool the way we are responding to overdose deaths. Um, like Rob said, so the, when the law was enacted in 2018, so from 2018 to 2021, IMPD had only um, submitted two cases to the prosecutor's office for dealing with guilty and death. Wow. Okay. Um, again, this, no fault of anybody, but it, the way the violent crime, the homicide rate, originally homicide investigators were tasked with these. Um, if there was no leads, and these guys are homicide detectives, right? Not really a narcotics background, these worlds have to blend. Um, so in order to take the burden off of homicide detectives and again to uh, increase success in identifying um, these traffickers of, of deadly drugs, um, we really had to rewrite, like Rob said, the entire playbook of what we did. Uh, so I looked around the country and kind of stole some things from, from uh, different cities, um, <laughs> Orlando, uh, El Paso, that kind of thing, what worked, what didn't work. And what we came up with is, uh, as a force multiplier, that cor deputy coroners are going to every scene, right? Uh, unless there are some uh, certain uh, circumstances that are out of place, like um, on a death scene when the door's kicked in or, or something doesn't look right, usually a homicide detective wouldn't be called out. Uh, so we developed a in partnership with, with Alfie, the deputy coroners in the prosecutor's office. We came up with a curriculum uh, to train the deputy coroners on what to look for at these scenes. Um, essentially, so if, if there's drugs present or paraphernalia with testable residue still in it, um, then that would that would begin them to uh, start looking a little further into uh, what's at the scene. So, um, as, as others will, will speak about, uh, electronic devices, specifically cell phones, are 99% of uh, what we are able to get investigative leads out on and then push this case um, to the point of presenting uh, for, for prosecution. Um, so if the phone is uh, on scene, accessible, a lot of these, their phones are locked, right? Um, and it, it, if sometimes you can't defeat the passcodes and it would take years because of all the algorithms and everything else to get the phone. So the phones are present, uh, I'm sorry, drugs, uh, paraphernalia, phones present. There's someone on scene, um, girlfriend, boyfriend, family member that has knowledge of who the source of supply for the decedent is, uh, maybe a co-user uh, that's there. Um, if there's a uh, video camera, ring camera, that kind of footage that we're able to grab, um, those kind of things, if, if certain criteria is met, three out of five, which I guess we go to the next slide and actually look at it. So you're gonna top the um, the qualifier is that the drugs and paraphernalia have to be there. The decedent, the decedent is positively identified. Uh, witnesses were present. Again, the telephone um, or electronic device is accessible. Uh, the fourth one may, may be weird and, and it rarely occurs, but we've had it uh, happen. It's more common where you have um, intimate partners or family members that are co-users and boyfriend brought it over, girlfriend used it, girlfriend overdosed and mm -hmm. died. So technically, the trafficking suspect is the boyfriend or the neighbor, whoever it is, right? Mm -hmm. It's very rare, but it, it does happen. Uh, and then possible video surveillance. If that criteria is met, that um, results in a physical response by the overdose team. Um, so again, with everybody else doing more with less, we have to figure out how is IMP going to staff this? So secondary to their primary duties, um, we selected FBI, Safe Streets Task Force, task force uh, DEA Task Force, which there are members of IMPD that are uh, assigned to these units. They're cross-designated as federal task force officers. Um, so when I use DEA and FBI, it's, it's IMPD detectives, it's our federal partners that are responding to these. Uh, our Metro Drug Investigators and our Interdiction Team. Um, so they all take a week on call, and they respond if a deputy coroner uh, sees this and the criteria is met. So went through the training, uh, trained the deputy coroners. Again, um, all the units I just spoke of, they're all primarily drug and violence, right? They're, they did not have, um, they, they weren't in the homicide or death investigation world. So that was teaching police officers, hey, this is also a homicide investigation. 
um, and to be looking in, uh, for the, those kind of evidence um, cursors. So uh, we did that, um, and I have to uh, applaud Alfie because her deputy corners took this training and ran with it. It was um, what we asked them to do. Uh, we the phone started ringing. Um, the, the scene photos they they, they took uh, are instrumental and. In the, majority of these cases that we're able to get filed. Um, again, in her office doing the toxicology and the autopsy, if we don't have that, these, these don't go anywhere. Um, our, our federal partnerships are huge. If we don't have the passcode to these phones, it takes the technology, you know, we obtain a search warrant, and it takes, it takes the technology to be able to get in these phones, and then we see um, the text messages to and from the dealers or multiple dealers, right? There's multiple sources, and that's the hard thing to prove. Did, did that person deal to the decedent and be able to prove that? And did that did those drugs kill them? Um, so all those all those stars have to align. Um, so since we started in February, uh, again we we had two from eight two cases that were. File for dealing resulting in death from 18 to 21. Since March of 22, we now have seven. Um, and then multiple other arrests for just the basic dealing, not the dealing resulting in death. A lot of this information we're getting out of the phones, it's going to provide multiple sources of drugs, right? So we're not going to be able to necessarily prove the dealing resulting in death, but through surveillance and other means, we're able to identify that dealer, use that decedent's phone as an investigatory tool to push us to hate. Let's go look at this guy or that, that lady or whatever. Um, so we've got, you know, uh, just the basic dealing cases, but uh, seven. So it represents a 250% increase um, since, since we started this. And this is all secondary to what um, these investigators are doing. Um, 92 physical scene responses. Um, we're averaging five uh, fatal overdose scene responses a month primarily on east, southeast, and southwest districts. Uh, currently, we have 12 cases open, awaiting phone data extractions. That's, that's where, you know, once we get the information, we send out search warrants to the phone carriers to get records, and then to actually get physically into the phone to get the data. Then we're waiting on autopsies and toxicology. So it's a lot of getting a lot of um, uh, search warrants out, subpoenas, and those kind of things, and it's just waiting for the information to come back. Um, once that information comes back, we develop a suspect, then we start our narcotics invest investigation. Um, start digging into to who this person is, what, what is their source of supply, and how is that, how are they getting it, right? Just keep moving up the ladder. Um, we also, so during this training, we also partner with uh, Overdose Lifeline, uh, which they supply the Narcan, and we, all the response teams have a supply of Narcan, so when we respond to these scenes, and the majority of them will have additional co-users there, right? So we provide that. Um, and often, uh, their supply of Narcan has been used unsuccessfully in the deceit past. So we have used Narcan, now they've exhausted their supply, so we, we're supplied with that. Um, uh, weekly, if not daily, uh, just because we don't respond to the scene doesn't mean that um, mom got into uh, the CD son's phone, was able to see text messages. They'll call the, the walk, they'll come up to homicide, they'll call us, hey, this is what I have. Or, you know, it, it's heartbreaking, but they're cleaning out the room and they find drugs, they find paraphernalia. So we'll respond to that, we'll recover it, uh, we'll take any information that they have. Um, and again, with, with over 800 uh, overdose deaths last year, we had to be methodical to be able to triage these, right? Um, to be able to see which ones have investigatory value that we're able to you know, workable leads. Um, majority of these, hey, when they're able to get in the phone, there's no video, um, there's no information from family or friends, so those cases are closed. Because um, unfortunately, you know, we have two a day, so we just keep coming. Um, so we predicted these and uh, these delays and these hurdles that we had to get over, and, and uh, you know, unfortunately, like um, what I mentioned before, it's, we had uh, a spouse. We had a case last year where um, husband and wife were uh, addicts, both co-users. Co um, husband passed away from overdose in the living room. Um, we went out to speak with the wife, collected all uh, additional evidence. Um, 
but that addiction is so strong that she did not want to give up her healer. So there's not, not much we can do on that. So we'll close it out, we give resources, um, and then move on. Uh, the passcodes um, are, are huge. Uh, if we can get into that phone, you know, as everyone knows, it's your life is pretty much on that phone. So we're able to find sources of supply, uh, conversations about uh, amounts, payment. A lot of this is um, you know, electronic payments anymore. It's not hand-to-hand -hand as it used to be, right? It's uh, Cash App, Venmo, you name it. So electronic records are, are huge. Um, and then actually getting the data off the phones. Um, and then um, just records. Um, you, know, you, you name the, the uh, application or social media platform. Oh, there's there's evidence there, so that's what um, that's what's leading us uh, to success in a lot of these investigations. So, like Lieutenant Andrew said, it's sort of a multi-stage process to investigate these cases. Uh, with, after Alfie's deputy coroners respond to a scene, that's where we're going to get that front line information. That's where we're going to find out, was there a substance recovered? Are there people who want to talk? Is there a phone? That's when Lieutenant Andrews detectives can come onto a scene, take over an investigation, and start talking to the prosecutor's office about what we need to make our case. Uh, and now we're going to have ASAP Gannon from DEA talk a little bit about different sources of evidence we see on these cases. Uh, they really run the gamut, where you have everything from physical evidence recovered to from a scene to just long, complicated, but very revealing electronic trails of information. Uh, one thing that amazes me about these cases that I've learned a lot about is, like Lieutenant Andrew said, most of these deals are not hand-to-hand -hand involving lots of cash. There is, uh, if you can find them, if you can access them and run them down, there's usually a long, pretty robust record of electronic financial transactions that back up these deals. Um, and our federal partners have done a great job working to do search warrants to get those records to prove not only did drugs change hand, but money did as well. So now Mike can talk about some of the sources of evidence that his investigators look for in these cases. Thank you, Rob. I'd like to just take a minute to thank each and every one of you for being here tonight. It's uh, so important in, in this line of work that we do. We're so passionate about these type of investigations because with the role I have, I've been with DEA uh, almost going on my 25th year now, and uh, I've been the assistant special agent in charge, uh, in charge of operations for DEA in Indianapolis for the last four and a half years. And we first started working these cases over, over that period. And while working these type of investigations, everybody hearing me okay? I'm talking a lot of when we, when we work these type of investigations, we often get called from family members or have, or have interaction with them. And I can honestly tell you when we dig into these investigations and just hearing the family members or hearing 911 calls that we've had to listen to, it's enough that we don't break down and start crying. I mean, it, it is brutal and it's devastating. And I say every, every time I get a chance to talk to people about fentanyl and just how devastating this drug is, I do it because you people here today, you're force multipliers, and you are the people that go out and make a difference. Not you know, law enforcement. We go out, we collaborate with one another, and we do the best job that we can. But it's you people that can really make the difference. And I ask people like yourself, if you have things going good in your life, please be a pillar of strength and try to help people that may be going down the wrong path. Because never in our country. Has there been a worse time to use drugs than right now? And just, I'm, I'm going to get into the stuff Rob is asking me to speak about, but I do want to touch on some numbers just to share with you guys. On a national level, 110,000 Americans die because of a drug overdose. 82,000 of that is potentially fentanyl, opioid related. So that equates, when you break it down, it's about 300 people a day that die of a drug overdose throughout the country. Can you imagine if 300 people were on a plane and it crashed every single day where the outrage would be in our country and the people that need to make a difference in our country? So I ask all of you to touch someone you can because we need people to make a difference. And in the state of Indiana, for 2022, there was 2,800 overdose deaths 
about 1,800 were fentanyl opioid related. And you saw Alfie put the numbers up for 2022. I think it was uh, 852 drug overdoses and 648 were fentanyl opioid related. So these investigations have to be done and it's so important because these families that lose a loved one, their life is affected forever. And if it was a friend, you know, a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad, they're devastated and they do want accountability for the people that are dealing with this lethal poison. And to mention um, fentanyl, it's mixed in with all types of drugs. So when we do these type of investigations, often we're getting called in after the fact. So there's challenges. But I'm proud to say over the last um, several years, we've been working a lot of these and we work them on a federal level or a state county level and we work them often with, with the Marion County Prosecutor's Office and Rob, you guys are doing outstanding work with us to do these investigations and I think, I think we've arrested about 25 people in the last several years in these type of investigations and they are so difficult because you're having, you're having to prove that the individual that gave that lethal dose was the last person that the person basically encountered and they got it from that person. And the challenges that we face in some of these investigations, many people that use drugs sometimes have several different suppliers. So we have to show that the specific supplier that we're looking to charge and the resultant in death case was in fact that person. So what we look for, uh, Lieutenant Andrews uh, hit some of these points, we look for the best circumstantial evidence we can get to uh, show uh, what's going to happen and, and we can get a successful prosecution because at the end of the day everybody has the compassion but a prosecutor has to walk in knowing they can prove beyond a reasonable doubt in court so we do a lot of very uh, different investigative techniques and it all depends on what we initially find in the case for for example if we find a, a cell phone and we're able to extract that that can be a treasure trove of evidence because you might have communications which uh, outline the deal about to happen and you can, you can get a little bit of a history between the decedent and the, and, and the, and the actual drug deal. So that's, that's huge evidence. But the, the reality of it is we don't just get a phone and, we, and we're into it. It's something that can take months. It's challenging. And then there's sometimes you, you can't break into it. So we try to tell people if someone's using drugs, write a code down so you have that code so someone can actually get into your phone or a family member can, because at the end of the day, you know, that, that's, a, that's a big challenge. So when we get that phone, we look through all these things and then, then we hope to identify a, a suspect. And if we're able to identify the suspect, you heard what the lieutenant had to say, we go into full background mode, how we're gonna look into the person and do what we would do in any type of criminal investigation and we gather as much information on that person as possible and we, we conduct a, a thorough investigation. And then oftentimes to show that a transaction may have occurred, you have to use cell site location in, in investigations. And it's very challenging because you have to prepare affidavits that have to be approved by a judge to show that there was probable cause and you have to get a court order to further uh, match some people's cell site for their phone. And why, why I say that's important because you want to show that at some point those two people and their two phones connected so you use electronic surveillance type techniques. It's very important to do these type of techniques. So when we're working these uh, type of investigations, that's just, that's just a necessity because we don't always have eyewitnesses that are going to come forward and say they saw a hand-in-hand -hand transaction. We don't have other witnesses that will come forward. But those are some of the steps that we take. We do thorough uh, steps such as look at all type of financial records as well to see if there was cash that was moved uh, through various uh, Snapchat or money cash applications. And that's the type of stuff that we're focusing on with, with these investigations. But at the end of the day, we have to have that overwhelming uh, evidence. So for us, it, it's very important because each time we get specific evidence, will follow up on additional investigative steps that can help get us to that uh, conclusion that, uh, that a drug deal happened and it resulted in death and the person that was responsible was in fact that person. So it, it, it is challenging, but at the end of the day, they're so important and you know, we're gonna continue to do that and we're honored to uh, 
collaborate hand in hand uh, with the coroner's office and of course IMPD and the Marion County Prosecutor's Office with these type of investigations. So, uh, was there anything else you wanted me to cover, Rob? Uh, sure. So, if you want to click through on this slide, there's some examples on there of just different evidence. Uh, so, for instance, an autopsy report, what yes. this is used for, what we can glean from that. Yes. Yeah, so, for example, if somebody has uh, has died because they were uh, overdosed uh, in fentanyl, it's very important for us to have a toxicology report that'll indicate that fentanyl was in fact uh, the cause of death. So when they go to prosecute the case, we have to, we have to show how important that is. And in, in, in this instance, that's like a, a pathology report, and it'll, it'll have the cause of death. And in this case, it's, a, it's acute combined fentanyl and methamphetamine toxicity. So it's important to, to have that because at the end of the day, if you don't have that, then they can, they can, uh, the defense can raise concern that you know, they, they didn't die of a fentanyl overdose. So we have to have these type of things, and it's so important. This is additional forensic testing that will give a toxicology of someone to, and let us know what was in, the, in their system. And these are just uh, additional important information that has to come forward for us and just uh, things that take time uh, when you're building these type of investigations. We talked about the uh, cell phone. We talked about how important it was. And uh, for us, that can be, that, that can be a treasure trove. That, that's where you, know, you have the conversation and it's so important, and I'm not going to sit here and read it, but if you, if you sit here and look at that, I'll take a minute and pause, you can, kind of, you can kind of see just how important this type of communication is, or the evidence uh, is, so, is so important. And the other thing that we get with these type of phone calls and text messaging, you can get historical information to show this wasn't like a one-time deal, and it gives, you, it gives you a good understanding who the sources of supply was and how long they've been actually dealing with one another. So that's why that evidence is so important for us. You can see right there by that communication, it's obvious that um, you know that that transaction shouldn't have been going on. And you know, I, I always say, un unfortunately, the people that that get involved with dealing drugs, they just don't care about people at the end of the day because you're you're affecting somebody's life. And we try to tell people if you're dealing fentanyl, you, you know, you're you're going to kill people. And it, for for the drug dealers, it's all about uh, making money. And, it, and it's very scary. And the, the other thing that people have to understand and I wanted to share with you is when fentanyl comes into our country, the precursor chemicals come from China, they go to Mexico, and then it's flooded into the United States and, and our community here in the Indianapolis area. And what ends up happening is drugs can often exchange hands like six or seven times from different drug deals before it gets to the streets of Indianapolis. So, any person that gets a hold of any of the drugs, whether it be cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, they're throwing fentanyl in at any chance they get because it's 50 times more potent than heroin ever was. So when you, when you have that, they can make more money with less product and it's synthetically made and it's very cheap to make. So that's why it's flooded the country. But that's why people have to understand every time you use any one of those drugs, you're just risking your life because you have to assume it's being laced with fentanyl. And we aren't even talking about the prescription pills they're trying to mimic, they are the, similar to the oxycodone pills, which is M30s, Percocet, and, and then you have Xanax, and you have uh, like uh, Adderall. So those are some of the pills that they're, they're adding fentanyl in, and they're trying to pass them off as prescription medication. So, that's the challenges we face, but what I always like to tell people, even though the numbers sound bad, each and every day we're out there on the streets working with our state and local partners to identify the most significant suppliers in our area responsibility. So we identify them and then we use all investigative techniques at our disposal to put the best case we can to put them uh, accountable for their actions and in addition to doing that, when we're working long-term cases, we try to identify the state or various cities where they're being supplied from, 
and we charge those people in addition to doing that we'll charge people in other countries that are bringing the stuff into our country and there's just challenges that come with that when we do charge those respective people it's called extraditions that have to take place and it can take years but I want to assure you we're going out each and every day and doing the very best we can to make our community a safer better place but again you people are the ones that are going to make the difference with us because you can be the pillar of strength and help people in the community and uh, that's all I pretty much have. If there's anything else uh, that you have for me, please let me know or any questions. But uh, that's all I got, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things I want to touch on looking at these text, mes text messages here uh, that's especially infuriating. Uh, you've seen these messages here. There was a drug deal that took place between these two individuals, and the purchaser says, I overdosed and died. They brought me back to life. I'm done with this stuff. And then as you continue to go through the text messages, the dealer reaches back out and offers to sell drugs again. So as a prosecutor's office, we're not looking to use this law in situations where we have two users who get together, one of them happens to bring drugs, they both use, and one person dies as a result. We want to use this law against people who have a predatory relationship with their customers, people who are taking advantage of people who have a drug addiction, and people who, we might catch them for one, dealing resulting in death, but chances are, based on the number of overdoses we have and the scale of drug dealing we see in this county, they have probably killed more than one person. So those are the types of cases we want to use this law for, are cases where we see the people who are having such a serious impact on our community and ruining so many lives. And then when we talked about the cell phone mapping, this is essentially what we prosecute, what we're demonstrating in court to show where a deal took place, how a drug dealer moved about the community. And then also looking at financial transactions, this is the type of stuff that we see on cell phones now. But when you look at this, we have a police officer who responded to the scene, probably somebody from EMS. We have a deputy coroner who responded to the scene. We have a pathologist who did the autopsy. We have the toxicologist who's in another area entirely who did the actual tox results from the blood work that was done as part of the autopsy. We have people who uh, interpret the cell phone records. We have people who download the cell phones. We have people who have to certify the records from these financial companies. Just the number of witnesses you need on these cases and the areas that those witnesses draw from is staggering. That's why they're so complex and that's why they're so difficult to actually get them to the place that they can be prosecuted. Uh, but fortunately, we have great partners here who help us on these cases. We could be the most gung-ho prosecutor's office in the state and say, we're going to prosecute these cases, we're going to bring these people to justice. That would be impossible without the investigators who help make those cases possible. So without the buy-in from the agencies that are represented up here, we would not be able to go forward on any of these cases. So that's why it's so important that they're here tonight to explain to you the role that so many different groups play in bringing these cases to court. Uh, that's really all I had in terms of presenting on a lot. Does anybody have any questions about this? Yes, sir. I'm just curious. In, in my naive mind, I'm thinking, well, these are cash transactions, but apparently not. The cash could be hard to trace, but so people are using that phone for um, making the, the connections, making the arrangements, the follow-up cash transactions, which are very time specific, I would suppose, are those also, can those be tracked by their cell location so that that $50 happened when that phone was at this location or whatever. So does that all come together because the phone gives you the information? Sure. So there's a question about financial transactions electronically versus cash and how we use those. So, you're exactly right. We have prosecuted these where they have been actual old-fashioned cash transactions. Uh, but ideally, if it's electronic, it works in our favor because what we'll have is a text stream that arranges a drug deal. We'll have that cell location data that shows the dealer, the suspected dealer, going to the place where the deal took place, probably the, the user's home. Or maybe we have the user, that customer, the deceit, going to the dealer's home and going back home. But we have cell location data that backs up our theory of the case. And then what we have after that 
or simultaneous with that, is a cash app transaction, a Venmo transaction, where you see money changing hands between the victim and the dealer. So in some ways, it's, it's a new uh, area of technology that we need to adapt to. We need to find out how to write search warrants for that data, how to interpret it. But when we get it, it really backs up the theory that, yes, a drug deal took place. How do we know that? Because this victim paid you for those drugs. They didn't give you money for nothing. That's, that's going to be the, the sort of the final bow on the case to say, not only was this transaction arranged, not only did you travel there, you received money for it. Yes, sir. Is that something that you're going to do or have been doing? Because it seems pretty conclusive, as you just said, but you only had 75 guys. And, that, and that's statewide. So right now, we have, I think, eight pending in Marion County. And I wish I could give you more specifics about all these cases, but since they are all pending, there's not much we can say about them. But that just goes to show how new this method of investigating them is. So since last spring, we've charged all of those eight cases, and there are several more that are in the works to be charged. These are major felony cases where, same with a murder case, it can take months, if not over a year, for them to actually come to a resolution in court. To be honest, as we are developing a playbook to prosecute these cases, defense attorneys are developing a playbook to defend individuals who are charged. So both sides of the justice system are figuring this out simultaneously. But we are actively prosecuting these cases. Uh, and it's, it's really because of the types of work that you saw here tonight that we're even able to bring them in the first place. As a dealer, I wouldn't do it electronically anymore. <laughs> you would think that uh, as dealers realize the types of investigative tools that, that people have, they would adjust their methods. But the fact of the matter is, there are so many drug transactions that take place daily, and it's so easy to do electronically, there's really no reason to, to go back to the old-fashioned way. Uh, the, the, the era of the sort of open-air drug market, hand-to-hand -hand transactions, it's mostly just done via telephone now. Yeah, Rob, and a, another thing too, in, in today's technology and the, and the people that the younger generation they're so used to just doing everything electronically. It's a quick, it's a quick transaction, and they don't, they don't think they're going to bring the scrutiny of us on them. But till after the fact, they, they're not realizing that, but they, they do do that. With the uh, that Indiana code that you had displayed up there, somewhere around it, it said intentionally delivers the rest of the code, whatever it says. Does it mean intentionally delivers? Um, does it mean you just intentionally delivered a drug? or you intentionally delivered a drug that you knew were going to cause? That's a good question about do we need to prove that the person knew that it was going to result in death? And we don't need to prove that. It's just, did they knowingly intentionally deliver it? Okay. Which is just the standard for, basically, did they commit drug dealing is the first question. So if we prosecute any drug dealer, we need to prove that they knowingly or intentionally delivered fentanyl. And that's the crime of dealing in it itself. And then the result part is, did it end up causing somebody's death? We just need to prove that it caused death, not that there was an, any intent on behalf of the dealer to cause that death. Good question, though. Is the fentanyl so separate, or does it, is it always mixed with other drugs? Sure, so she asked about, is fentanyl sold separate, or is it mixed with other drugs? I guess, maybe, Asa, Gannon, do you want to talk about sure. what you see it in and how that works? Yeah, it's typically mixed into other drugs, uh, but for example, just, uh, we always try to give an analogy for fentanyl so people can you know, visualize something. If you think of a tip of a pencil or the penny of Lincoln's ear, that amount of fentanyl that would be on the tip of a pencil or that would fill up his ear on a penny, that could be considered a lethal dosage unit, which is just two milligrams. So if they, if they put that in like a, a mimic prescription pill, it's probably just gonna have fentanyl in it. But that's what I'm trying to tell everybody in here. If you're using other drugs, which you don't think is a big deal, like cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, they're throwing it in that as well. And then, and, and what people don't understand, before it ever gets to our streets here, I already told you, it could exchange hands six, seven, eight times, and each time anybody can put what else, whatever they want in it. And we know that you know two major cartels have flooded our country, which is the Sinaloa cartel and CJNG. But here in Indianapolis, 
We've seized hundreds of thousands of these pills over the last couple of years, including several pill presses uh, where people are trying to manufacture them themselves here. So, you know, you could get kilogram amounts of fentanyl and then you try to create your own uh, pre look-alike prescription pills. So it's very dangerous. And uh, that, that's typically how it's packaged or utilized. In the back. One is, is it true that about 90% of fentanyl that comes from Mexico comes through checkpoints rather than, you know, I don't know. So the question was about the percentage of fentanyl that comes from Mexico through checkpoints. It's like, Anna, do you know what the numbers are on exactly yeah, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll give you this. The precursor chemicals, they come from China and they get into Mexico, and then they have clandestine laboratories that make the fentanyl. And then what you have to understand is a drug dealer and drug cartels are going to look for any vulnerability they can to get the drugs into the country. So there's a number of ways it, it, it can get into the country. And uh, that's, that's just how it, how it works. And unfortunate, it's unfortunate, and we're, we're being flooded with it. And then the other is, on autopsy, how do you determine that a death is accidental rather than intentional? So that's a good question. Uh, she asked about classifying a death as accidental versus intentional. Elfie, do you want to talk about yeah. the different classifications of cause of death? Right. So when we look at um, death investigations, we look at was the death, um, what, so we have uh, five manners of death, homicide, suicide, accident, natural, and undetermined. So when we see these investigations, people who are ingesting these drugs are not doing it to take their own life. They have an addiction, they're ingesting the drug, and it is then subsequently causing their death. So that is how we classify it as an accidental death as opposed to, and we don't call it homicide, because at the time that the person is ingesting the drug, they don't intend to cause their own death, and they don't know what drug they're getting that is also going to cause their death. So that's why we classify them as accidental drug overdose deaths, as opposed to intentional, which would be a suicide. That's more a situation where we have some other background information that would suggest that the person wanted to end their life. Sir. So I have the ultimate amount of respect for what it is you guys do. I'm 73 and I've been following this community and Ryan and a whole bunch of organizations for years. But the paradigm for me is that since you're working on that side of it, helping solve, helping to educate, the part of it that I don't see out there is finding ways that you can communicate to the people who are doing this, what it is that they're doing. You're trying to educate us, and that's a marginal thing for you to do in this kind of a capacity. We see things on 60 Minutes and the 6 o'clock news about all of the after effects. But, you know, we used to see ads, you know, this is what your, li your mind looks like on drugs and so forth. We're not seeing any of that. Nobody's talking to the people who are doing this stuff about what it is they're doing and to their relatives and to the people around them and giving them what I call an actionable thing to do where you say if you've got a kid that's doing this, if you've got a relative that's doing this, if you know you have a drug house taking place next door, what do you do? Because part of what it is that I don't see is you guys getting the help you need from the community because there is no, communication is the two-way street. And you're trying to tell people what it is you're doing and you'd like our help, but there's this impasse that's just totally outside what I consider a normal paradigm. And I'd open it to anybody who wants to say, well, but we're doing this because this, what Ryan's doing once a year, I think is great, but it is so fun. This is not Marion County sitting in this room. 
and I don't know whether the guy in the ca with the camera behind me is going to make this available or how that works, but I would recommend this to everybody in the city. It's just not happening. I could say a couple of things. Well, uh, thank you for sharing that because it, it is important. But I know, like, uh, we're doing everything we can to get that out there. We're going to schools, colleges, getting on TV, talking about it. We have like a, a one pill can kill campaign. We're talking about how dangerous fentanyl is. Uh, we took it to when the Indy 500 came. We collaborated with IMPD and the state police. We have a car that's painted that says one pill can kill danger fentanyl. We parked it in front of the Indy 500. So we're getting out in our community. We went out on Fourth of July parades to pass out literature and stuff like that. So we're doing everything we can possibly do to raise that awareness. But that's why I say you are all the power. You are the voice of power because together we can do it, but we can't do it by ourselves. Now we'll put cases together and we'll arrest people, but we need people that can help people get out in their communities and want to make a difference and tell people to avoid using drugs um, because that's what, that's what it's going to take. It's that prevention, but we're going to schools, we're doing it. We're doing it at colleges. We're looking for outside the box thinking to go to other events to do it. And, all, all law enforcement is doing that. We're doing that all over. So we, that's why it, you know, we're calling on the community to help out. It's an important matter. And, and any chance we can get on the media, we do it. I do a lot of media here in Indianapolis. And I, and I do share that. And we, and we talk about it all the time. So um, I do appreciate you saying that. But yeah, we need more effort all the time. We need people to step up. And I, and I love to use this quote because it's so important. John Wooden once said, who's a legendary basketball coach, was from Indiana. You can't live a perfect day until you've done something for someone who can never repay you. And I say that never have we needed more people like that, and never has there been a worse time in our country to use drugs than right now. So that, that's how we have to do it. I hope that helps. Nope. Right on target. How are the ingredients monitored that they use to make the drugs? Like, if people, if a vendor is selling too much of what is used to make these uh, products, how, how is that being monitored? So the question was about monitoring items that are being used to sell drugs, or to, to manufacture drugs, sorry. So it's it's not like the way it used to be with people making methamphetamine here, where you would go to a CVS and buy common household ingredients and manufacture methamphetamine. The manufacturing side is taking place almost entirely outside of the United States. So we're not seeing the substance until it is in that sort of final form, whether it's a large scale interdiction case where they're pulling off bricks of fentanyl or cocaine, pounds of methamphetamine, or in user cases where we're finding what looks like an oxycodone pill, but it's actually just fentanyl. In terms of the manufacturing, that's, that is an international issue. Explain a little bit. Um, so there's, obviously there's no quality control. <laughs> like Mike said, as it exchanged hands, different dealers will put different potencies in it. Um, and then they can market their drugs. Hey, I've got the latest and greatest. It's the best stuff ever. Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, so you'll see very different degrees of it. You know, locally, you'll see it mixed in cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine. But they'll do it <coughs> in the kitchen with blenders. Um, they'll do it with hand grinders. And then they'll put it in the pill press and make, you know, uh, however you want to adjust it. Mm -hmm. Absorb it, snort it, shoot it, however, you know, what your your, your means of uh, ingesting it, maybe. So, and then, sir, to you on, on uh, kind of public awareness and the outreach, um, again, with, we work uh, heavily with the overdose lifeline folks. Uh, there are Narcan, uh, naloxone vending machines all over the city. It's the Criminal Justice uh, Center, the campus there, they're at uh, district roll calls, um, are all over the city. They also have, provide fentanyl test strips which um, the legislature was able to remove that as being part of paraphernalia because it, it tests the purity of. So the governor and the state house removed that as being um, possession of paraphernalia so these addicts are able to use, and those struggling with addiction are able to use these fentanyl test drugs and test the drugs that they purchased before they ingest them. Really? So, and th those billboards are... That's not been publicized very well. Yeah. There's, there's a handful of billboards across the city about the fentanyl test drugs. But, you know, there's different, different ways of trying to combat it. Yeah. I'm in a question. You, you're I'm in a, 
have any of these cases been successfully prosecuted? I haven't been around town in five years. Sure. So I can tell you, not in Marion County. Every case that has been investigated and filed under the method that we're talking about here is still pending. This is a new approach that everybody has joined together to try. So hopefully next year we'll be able to give an update at the next CJA and say here's where we're on these cases. But we are currently litigating them in our major felony courts right now. You mentioned that Marion County prosecutor is only prosecute or tr attempting to prosecute the ones where the dealer's the really bad guy and not the buddy that's just sitting there getting high or you know still giving. The, the drug, are the other counties pursuing it in that manner? Are we ahead of everybody, behind everybody? Where are we at with the rest of the state? So I can't speak exactly to how other counties are doing, and I haven't looked closely at, at each and every case that they file. I do know that was a concern when this law was passed, um, and that's just been our approach, that we want to focus on dealers who are having a, a, an outsized impact on the community here and look for those predatory relationships between dealers and victims. So I, I don't know what standard other counties use for that, but that's our approach. But what if the buddy gives it to his next buddy? What What's the difference? No, he didn't mean that he isn't aggressively doing it, but he still potentially could have killed the same two people. And that's why that electronic trail is so important for us. Many of the cases that we look at, it, it becomes very clear if we're able to get a search warrant for the suspect's cell phone. The person who died is not the only person they are selling drugs to. And, and that is really the, the most important criteria I look at is, could this have happened to another one of this dealer's customers? Um, so that, that electronic tail, trail of text messages is, is really vital in identifying. This is somebody who is a user who had the misfortune of getting a bad batch of drugs and sharing it with a friend versus somebody who is spreading this poison throughout multiple people in the community. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, I know we've done about 25 of these cases, and in each and every one of them, it's clear that these people were drug dealers, not like a buddy that, hey, take this uh, Adderall, will help you study better for a test, and then next thing you know, the person died of a fentanyl overdose. It, they're not like that. It's apparent that they're drug dealers. And the, and the charges are warranted uh, in, in these instances. But you want to stop it, but you're, you're only stopping the really bad guy and not the other 150 people. No, we're, we're, we're talking about the cases that we've been able to investigate that you could follow all the evidence and prove beyond a reasonable doubt. But uh, I, I understand your concern, but at the end of the day, it's all about making the cases. They're very difficult to make in the first place, and that's why it's, it's an evolving process. Do you apply that same process to adolescents? So the question about adolescents, do you mean adolescent dealing suspects? Yes, and those that are, uh, because ad I work with adolescents, they have their own unique code of how they do things. So they get together and they exchange stuff. And I happen to work in a hospital, I've seen a lot in the ICU. And this new thing that's out that's more potent than fentanyl ISO, is that here in Indiana now? What is it called? ISO, I can't really say the chemical name. It's worse than, it's more potent than fentanyl. We've had a couple of a case, a pile of case. With that, so I'm just wondering, do you do adolescents? Does a lot, do you apply this process when you prosecute adolescents? So in terms of applying this law to adolescents or juveniles, the law would apply the same way that any criminal offense can be prosecuted against a juvenile <coughs> a juvenile court. I have not had any yet, we have not filed any yet. Part of the challenge of that might be if you're looking at a community of juveniles who are selling drugs, using drugs, it might be through different communication channels. So finding that evidence might not be as obvious as in some of these other cases where the victim contacts their drug dealer via text message or Facebook messenger. Getting inside of that world and kind of cracking that code and, and uncovering those communications, that's the first step to proving these cases. So I imagine that might be an additional hurdle dealing with juveniles where they're using different platforms, different methods of communication. But absolutely, the law could be applied to them in juvenile court. So if you have a situation where 
you can't, you don't have what you need. Well, you know, you're pretty sure from what you're seeing that this is a drug dealer and blah, blah. And there's this electronic record of all these payments. Is it possible to suggest to the IRS that they might want to look to see if this person has unreported income that they could go after him? So that's actually a great question. She had asked about using the IRS possibly to go after money for suspected drug dealers where we can't make these cases. Actually, much easier than that, instead of treating it as a deal resulting in death investigation, if we just can't get over that hurdle and we just can't get to that proof point where we're confident to file it, we can just treat that person as a regular target of a drug investigation. And one of IMPD's units dedicated to those types of crimes can investigate that person and hopefully file a case on them just for dealing drugs. Uh, maybe we're not able to link the actual fatal dose from the suspect to the victim, but we've gained enough intelligence that they can then pursue a drug case against that person and charge them just for dealing drugs. To, to expand on that, so we look at a decedent's phone, so the decedent's helping us. They're, they're essentially an informant, and we're taking all that information and then targeting whatever source of supply that we can identify and working those cases. Again, it's a very high bar to get to dealing resulting in death, but the majority of our cases do result in some type of dealing charge. And then, sir, to your talking about the phone records, so we will overlay the financial records, the timestamp when it was the payment was sent to the communications, right, back and forth, to the historical data of where the phone physically was. And then to expand on that, what else does that phone tell us? So we, we have a pattern of life on that decedent. If they're making 200 calls a day and you know 5,000 texts, and then that phone stops, we have a pretty good indication of when the overdose occurred. So then we can work with, with Alfie and, and the pathologist and know that this last transaction occurred here, activity on the phone stopped here, and a lot of these, you know, with the Apple Health and those kind of tracking apps, you can see where activity stopped, and then we can start working the case that way. So um, I just like to thank you for doing this because I think it's not enough to be not using drugs. We have to be anti-drugs. And uh, I believe the community has obligations, primary obligations to play a role in this. Um, I'm from the Muslim community. Uh, we had our first and only drug overdose that we know like three, four years yeah. ago. And uh, we made it a public matter that if we know someone who's dealing with drugs in our community, we need to make sure we report them to the authorities. And I'm hoping that we all have the same audacity. I'm not trying to impose my rules, or my rules on anyone, but I think we have to have audacity to take this on our, uh, on our hand. Uh, the second is question, uh, by adding to what the gentleman was saying, those who need to hear this message are not here. Um, and I'm sincerely hoping that we will have a methodical outreach program in schools. Uh, we have a great anti-bullying uh, program that we do in mean, the prosecutor's office there. And I'm hoping we can have this kind of events in schools, and I'm looking forward to welcoming you in our school. Uh, and I'm hoping that we see these faces talking to the youth who are increasingly not using drugs but dealing drugs now. I appreciate that. And to your point about communication, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been at community events and somebody will pull me aside and mention either a car that's in their neighborhood or a house that they believe uh, drugs are being sold out of. And we have a great partnership with IMPD where I can refer that, that address to the right district, to the right investigative group, and they can start looking into it. And that's the type of thing where I hope that the community has the trust in our office and in the justice system in Marion County to be able to, to trust that we can take that tip and start working on it. Uh, and it'll never come back to the person who tipped us off to it initially. But that type of conversation happens all the time at events like that, and, and I really appreciate the fact that people are willing to come forward and, and, and let us know. Maybe it's time for one or two more. Hey, we're back. Um, as far as awareness goes, um, I live in Speedway, and I don't know about the car that we had parked in front of the track, but the sex trafficking has done a lot for awareness, and putting information on cards and making it available in bars or restaurants or bathrooms or parks in those bathrooms. Is there something like that that could be done with the, the drug awareness as well? Just saying, you know, here's where you can get the Narcan if you need it on hand, or here's where you can get the test strips, or just 
the one pill can kill campaign can that be put in more public places where children have access to it if they go to the park restroom or put it in the school bathrooms or guidance office or you know like I said when you've got 400,000 people milling around in Speedway during the 500 there's a lot of information being passed around to get help with those girls and boys that are being sex trafficked. <coughs> Why isn't that information for this being passed around the same way? I can, I can tell you, I would say approximately 80%, maybe more, of Mary County schools have Narcan um, mm -hmm. available, right? Um, after IMP, our federal partners have a major takedown, um, a large seizure, or even a, maybe even a mid-level seizure, um, they will push those resources. So the overdose lifelines and those groups will go out to that effective area where the seizure uh, occurred and then do outreach there because those suffering from addiction, now that their source of supply has been removed, they will seek you know, outside different suppliers, not know the purity, not be uh, adjusted to it, and they're getting from dealer B, you know, they used to do two grams of name your drug right from this dealer. Now they're going to dealer B whose potency is this and we're seeing overdoses. Uh, we're also seeing overdoses immediately after uh, being released um, from jail or uh, home detention or those kind of things were no longer being monitored. Uh, they went in using you know, three grams. They've been in for six months. Their tolerance is lower. They go back out, back to the same level and they're immediately overdosing. Um, so those kind of outreach, uh, it, it's, it's out there. And again, uh, these, these uh, not-for-profits are proactive and, hey, see where there was a drug seizure, can you tell us what zip code? And they will push the resources out. They, they pull up a trailer with a truck with a trailer and say, hey, here's a resource that's usually test strips, here's an Narcan, here's to help with your addiction. So I know that is occurring, and I know the Narcan's in the schools. Yeah, uh, thanks, Nick. In, in addition to that, too, I know for DEA, we have uh, DEA.gov, and if people go onto that website, it has a plethora of information. And when I first became the ASAC for DEA here in Indianapolis, I hooked up with the uh, Indiana Department of Education, and I asked them to put operationprevention.com on their, on their school website, which they did, so that should be going out to all the counties. And uh, operationprevention.com, was done with DEA in partnership with Discovery Education, and it has PowerPoints that have audio and video displays, uh, how to talk to people about drugs, the danger of drugs, and prevention, so it's great resources for anybody, and it's free. So all, all this stuff is free. If people go onto any of those sites, instant information about the issues with drugs. We have that whole One Pill Can Kill campaign, which you know talks about fentanyl, and we're happy to, uh, Anybody that would want that information, we, we we're happy to like you know get that information to these various schools that may not have it. But we did uh, do that, and I did do that. So thank you. Thank you. So we'll wrap up now. I want to thank you all for attending. I want to thank you all for being engaged and coming out to learn more about this problem and, and how we're all working together to try to, to make a difference here.